с Кельси находимся в библиотеке Station F, крупнейшего инкубатора для стартапов, известного уже во всем мире. Тот проект, на котором Кельси с ее партнером Антоином, основателями создателями создатели студии архитектуры и дизайна Катвер, трудились и который уже успешно функционирует пару лет. В продолжение разговора мы также проговорим про флейтмейт, калин, который был специально разработан, опять-таки, с помощью ребят для Савьера Ниеля, девелопера, реализовавшего проект, девелопера, поверившего в проект. Поэтому давайте уточним, что же это за проекты и что такое Катвер в целом. Now it's famous and famous already in the world, especially because of two big, let's say, huge project, Station F. Uh, the largest incubator for startups in the world and Flakemates co-living for 600 persons. We know that uh, you have your own uh, vision about ideology of architecture and ideology of design. That's why, first of all, what is Cutwork about? So, we founded Cutwork three years ago um, based on the idea that three things are fundamentally changing. Uh, the way that we work is changing, the way that we live is changing, and the way that we produce is changing. And so we formed Cutwork as a way to respond to these changes um, using architecture and design. So Cutwork is an architecture and design studio that designs spaces and furniture for new ways to live and work, notably co-working and co-living spaces, two uh, sectors of the market that are seeing explosive growth uh, and that we believe are only going to continue to grow, particularly co-living. Cutwork was founded based on these three principles, as I mentioned, the way we work has changed, the way we live has changed, and the way we produce has changed. And we often think about the macro scale facts that are pushing these types of changes uh, from a societal perspective, from an economic perspective, um, and there's quite a few of them that we refer to often. First is rapid urbanization, the fact that we'll be 7 billion people on the planet by the year 2050 and that 70% of these people will continue to live in cities. Therefore, the price of meter squared and square foot will continue to rise, where the cost of available meter squared and square feet will continue to decrease. So there needs to be a shift in perspective of how we accommodate so many people in urban cores. Next is the rise of the freelance workforce. Um, which in the year I was born, 1989, uh, represented only 6% of the global workforce. Today in the US alone, freelancers represent over 40% of the global workforce and it's predicted that globally in the next several years this will be over 50% globally. Another factor is the sharing economy. Um, people who are from a younger generation are more and more open to sharing um, and more open about what can be shared. Cars can be shared, apartments can be shared, offices can be shared, what else can be shared? We're only seeing the beginning of, of the types of uh, companies that are blooming because of this tendency. We are the first generation um, to earn less money at the same age as our parents. So this is also triggering different behaviors in renting and buying, particularly in real estate. Younger people aren't just aren't buying the way that they used to. So different models are emerging to accommodate these needs, which is one of the biggest influencers of co-living. Well, lastly, um, the fall of traditional family structures over across the world is also playing a big factor into this. To give you uh, a pretty radical example, in the city of Munich, uh, in Germany, the traditional mononuclear family, so two parents with two children, for example, makes up less than 14% of all global households, and it is around which our entire cities have been built. Um, so co-living also provides an example of how to look at different formats to provide housing structures, housing solutions for the way people are actually living today. This is a really key factors which are triggering the movement of economy and uh, the movement for a new point of view for architecture and design especially and also in such traditional sphere like um, real estate so these k factors in, uh, have influence already here exactly we're already seeing it happening in europe it's the market is moving much faster in the us where investors and banks are being much more aggressive about, uh, in particular with co-living, um, about creating a niche asset class in the real estate market, um, something that would resemble student housing or retirement housing, which I think in the next few years we'll begin to see co-living much more normalized in this way. 
for us, as we're looking at architecture and design, we need to think differently about the way spaces are built. We need to think differently about how architecture is put into the world today. For now, exactly for our time, because of our lifestyle change, our uh, working style change, what is architecture about? For us, architecture is much more about concrete and bricks and exterior and facade and materials, but it's really thinking about what's going to happen inside of the space, and in particular, between people who are inhabiting the space. Um, how communities are formed, how connections are made, how people, how we can begin to look at the success of a space less on how many meters squared a space contains, but more on how much capacity for social interaction and social exchange can be, can be happening within a space. So architecture now is also about communications and collaborations uh, between people who is inside. Certainly, because a space is just a frame. It's a frame for what's happening inside. And today things are happening a lot differently inside than they were even five years ago. Um, we like to think of this um, a lot with an example that we give quite often, um, that in 1864 Alicia Otis Graves invented the elevator, which radically changed the way we could build our cities. With the elevator we could build up instead of out, so this limited urban sprawl, and allowed us to see the birth of the commercial office tower and the modern apartment block, which is the, the cornerstone around which all of our modern cities are built today. And the question is, what is the key factor for now? for? which is change the cities and change. We believe that we're in the process of seeing an, inno an innovation that is even more radically changing this landscape, which is the mobile computer and the portable telephone. With our iPhone, with our iPad, with our MacBook, we can work from anywhere. And we no longer have to define spaces based on what's going to happen inside of them in a very rigid way. We don't have to have a room as an office that's set up with a desk with a fixed computer. An office can be anywhere. Look around here. There's people working in the library, there's people working in the cantina, there's people working in the cafe. People can accomplish their work from anywhere now. So this frees up space from a predefined function and gives a lot more room to create flexible, elastic, versatile spaces that are much more interesting and people like spending time in them a lot more and they spend a lot more time in them. They stay longer as tenants, they consume more inside of a space, they feel happier, they work better. Um, so all of this is really changing the way that we can build and that we can design today. So it's a really exciting, it's a really exciting field to be in. Interesting factor. В свое время, когда семья Отис изобрела лифт, это дало толчок к новому восприятию городов, к их развитию. Мы сейчас поговорили с Кельсией, что же является толчком и ключевым фактором для развития городов, развития пространств и новой архитектуры сейчас. И как ни странно, это не касается сферы строительства, не касается сферы проектирования и архитектуры. Ключевой фактор, который влияет на развитие городов, на то, как сейчас они будут выглядеть, на то, какими мы увидим пространства и в каких пространствах мы будем жить и работать, является лэптоп, ноутбуки, мобильные телефоны и все портативные устройства, которые позволяют делать пространство максимально многофункциональным. So, if I understand right, uh, now the uh, main uh, function for any space, I mean the key point for any space, is a flexibility. I think that for these types of spaces, flexibility and multi-use, the ability to transform a space for multiple uses at different times of the day, for different uses, it's really looking at designing space smartly, making space really efficient so that during the day you can have a library in the evening it can become a space for parties it can become a space for a dj to come play which just allows for different usages throughout the day with the way people are inhabiting space moving more towards a model where we use space across the the span of an entire day for multiple ideas rather than just for one fixed usage mm -hmm. and um, 
we perfectly know that uh, globaliz globalization is uh, rising and we feel it's like something in the air and uh, it's already the fact in one example place we can meet people with different mentality, people from different countries, people from different points of view, different culture and different habits. So how uh, to organize a place where every people uh, and all differences uh, will be feel comfortable? Hmm. What is the key aspects? This is a great question. This is design, isn't it? Because the way we design a space is a real symbol. It's, a, it's, it's an indicator of how people are going to feel. And when you create a space that's very diverse, that's very eclectic, um, people often tend to feel at home more. And for us, one of the things that we, we hold really strong to in our design is not over-designing a space so that people feel kind of branded or it being too loud or too stereotypical. I think that we need to design spaces that leave blank space and leave room for interpretation for people to appropriate space, especially in co-living. When you design apartments, um, for example, our co-living project here in Paris, Flatmates, mm -hmm. it's 600 apartments, 600 bedrooms uh, shared over 100 flats. So how do we design for 600 different people who are going to feel at home, yes. who are coming from all over the world, who ha are different ages, have different tastes? And so that was one of the key challenges of the design that we did was how do we design something that's neutral enough that people feel at home, they feel comfortable adding their own touch of things, um, but that also feels designed. Um, and this is kind of, I think, the secret recipe of how we do that. I, I wouldn't say there's a, there's a formula, but it's, it's really about being sensitive to space, sensitive to light, um, sensitive to materials and, and really looking from a holistic perspective of designing for different types of people with different types of living habits. Как мы все знаем, да и последняя статистика показывает, что сейчас люди ищут комфорт. Но само понимание слова «комфорт» уже изменилось. Теперь это не просто квадратные метры. Давайте же уточним, что Кельс понимает под этим определением. So, uh, now we perfectly know and we perfectly see that people looking for comfort, comfort places. But uh, the meaning of the word comfort has already changed also. What do you understand uh, under world comfort? What is it about? Comfort in a private space and comfort in a public space are two very different ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we're really seeing with co-working and co-living is People, younger people aren't craving comfort in a secluded space. No longer their big flat with their big apartment with everything closed off. They're more craving comfort in a social setting or comfort in a public space. Um, or at least they're becoming more open to it. So where, and I think comfort is changing in terms of how we actually use space. Mm -hmm. And the way co-living is evolving where we sacrifice for a smaller bedroom, for example, we have larger shared public space. And these public spaces can be very comfortable. They can be very cozy, they can be very open, um, and they just accommodate a lot of different ideas of comfort. But you agree that people are looking for comfort, exactly. It was the main target. I mean, if compared with square meters. Mm. Yeah, I think so, but I think this idea of comfort is changing. And what we used to think of comfort as a luxury apartment or a luxury high rise, it's no longer the case for a large population of people, um, especially people under the age of 35 living in cities. The idea of comfort has just evolved. And the real estate market is needing to catch up because it's quite a traditional space. Um, but people who are seeing this trend and moving ahead of the curve are understanding that Comfort means different things for different people and also taking into account the economic realities that a very large portion of the renting population can't afford luxury apartments uh, in city centers. So it's creating a different offer, I think. You uh, 
developed the design for flatmates, Korean for 600 persons. Uh, when we discussed our project in Russia in St. Petersburg in Korean format and thought about uh, how many people uh, will be interested in, uh, in living there in Korean, uh, a lot of people had a lot of doubts how much it will be in demand. What do you think about it? Uh, for how much uh, flatmates already full? Uh, for 600 people, maybe you already have some uh, waiting list for people who want to live there. Uh, and what is the trend for how much it will be in design? Because it's really an interesting question. Well, Flatmates is a little particular because it's open first and initially to all of the entrepreneurs working at Station F. Um, it's also only been open for less than six months. Um, so this project I know has been successful in terms of rentals. Um, but maybe a more interesting project to talk about is Common in the US, which is one of the largest co-living co players in the market. And Common sits at 98% occupancy for all of their spaces. Um, they receive roughly 2,000 applications per month. Um, and I think what's really different about what, what the key is for creating these kind of sticky environments is having a really powerful blend of very strong branding, so a brand that's identifiable, that can be recognized in the marketplace and that creates trust among people living there. Um, mobility, so having different sites in different cities where people who signed a rental agreement, for example, in Paris might be able to very easily, even through an app, move to a same flat by the same company in London. Um, I think this type of mobility is really interesting and what we're going to see the really successful players be able to do who are reaching some scale. The other thing is the use of digital, digital leasing services, so being able to sign everything on your phone, sign a lease, pay a bill, communicate with other people in the building, cr report a problem. Um, these types of services are creating insane stickiness and people mm -hmm. just love it because it's so easy and it takes a lot of friction yes. away. Hmm. A couple of seconds and Everything is ready. Yeah, Everything super is easy. Prepared. Yeah, but and this is also really interesting for investors because once you kind of get someone into the system, they're very likely to stay. As long as the service level remains high, um, people are very likely to stay. And that's really what a co-living is, right? It's a serviced apartment um, where people accept smaller living space for their personal space with larger service, more interesting public spaces, like for example, laundry services, cleaning services, restaurants, cafes, um, all within the same building. And if I was right that uh, people are ready to pay even more for this uh, kind of living if compared with classical apartments? I think it depends on the market. I think it depends on which market you're in, but it's Initial research is showing that co-living can be even more profitable for investors than traditional apartments. Uh, one study being done now in the U.S. is assuming that co-living may be able to have 8 to 11 percent higher yields than a traditional uh, rental apartment, which is around 1 to 3 percent. Um, but we're, we're in the prototype phase, right? We're understanding what this beast is going to be, how to best design spaces. And from our perspective, um, it's a lot of experimentation and we're seeing a lot of people beginning to dare in the market to try different things, to be brave, to be ahead of the curve and to not listen to traditional conventions of what's always been working and to look at spatial design as, a, as, an, evolving, as an evolving trend. Um, and I think that another taking cues from co-working where we have a lot of flexible design in materials such as walls for example, looking at walls as something more like a furniture than a structural element. So, of course, having structural elements of the bu building, but having very easily disassembling walls that are able to move to create larger spaces, smaller spaces. And then we have a lot more flexibility to test and to iterate and to see what's working. Mm -hmm. And as we know already, Korean is also about community. Mm -hmm. uh, but how help people to become a part of community? Because uh, uh, as we spoke before, uh, there are a lot of different people with different habits, different uh, mentality, different interests uh, and so on. Maybe uh, some kind of uh, special uh, events program, mm. some traditional dance, uh, I don't know, uh, some rituals. How to help them? 
I think the big difference is social space. Mm -hmm. It's shared open spaces. This is really what makes it different from just a flat, just a building of apartments. Um, so this ability for people to meet up outside of their apartments or outside of their rooms creates a lot of connection. I think programming is really important, so having... Um, Which can be, a, how, how to say, the reason for communication, to, to discuss a movie, to discuss something. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, programming, we're seeing it in all of the most successful spaces. Even hotels are moving into this as well, where they have different DJs coming to perform DJ sets in the evening. Maybe they have a hairdresser once a week that's in the mm -hmm. building. They have yoga classes. There's often daycares. There's a lot of different things that are happening that are creating a lot of movement. Um, they, you know, looking at it as an idea where ideas can spread also. So having conferences, having events, bringing in people from all over the world. This is a, this is a really interesting way just to create a lot of fireworks and a lot of stuff happening inside of a building. And more or less, how many services in flight points? Just to understand. How many services within flight yeah. points? Mm. So flatmates currently uh, they're in development of all of the social spaces, but they're building a blanchisserie, which is laundry services, cafe, um, gym, uh, and then they have also very generous public space on the exterior with outdoor places, and they'll have full programmation of events. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very connected to Station F here, so it's only 10 minutes away by scooter. Mm -hmm. uh, so they do a lot of cross cross coordination of the events. Um, but I think one other really important factor, a K factor, mm -hmm. with the success of shared space like co-living is creating an interesting enough program that people who also live in the city want to come and explore. Ah, so it's not a place only for co-livers, yeah. but also for locals. Yeah. So they uh, feel them themselves not just like guests, but also they have feelings that they are locals. Exactly. People want to feel local today when they travel. With this mood of globalization, they no longer... People like me no longer want to travel to a cookie-cutter hotel that's the same in every city. They want something like the Airbnb effect, where they're able to come and meet local people and experience a local culture often on top of a business travel, so we're catching a lot of business travelers in this, uh, in this sector. But they want to feel a part of something bigger, they want to feel a part of the fabric, they want to just get it. And co-living and micro-stay apartments and short-stay uh, um, apart hotels can really play with this. I think that's really, uh, there's a big opportunity there for that. And when you, when you are able to attract a local community, you just create a certain atmosphere. A really cool place so then you're able to as an investor from an investor perspective you're able to have a restaurant that's full all the time you're able to have a cafe that's full all the time local companies can rent out meeting rooms for example so you create a lot of opportunities for revenue streams um, so essentially from the design from the way that you think about this but how this is and to maximize profit mm -hmm. and uh, what do you think uh, do they understand Caribbean like a home, home for mm. them? Or do they understand Caribbean like a, just a place for short stay, for a couple of months of living and so on? I mean, uh, exactly home feeling. Is it exist for them or not? Well, co-living's been around for less than five years, so we haven't really had a time for someone to live there for 20 years and decide if it makes home. But what we do know is that the market is maturing and co-living operators are beginning to think of more niche ways of offering co-living as a service. For example, Common in the US is offering Kin, which is a co-living space dedicated for families. Mm. So it's looking at the different life cycles of people living in co-living and then diversifying the options to provide the adequate housing solution for different phases of life. Because obviously you're looking for a different type of apartment if you're 25 and moving to a city and getting your first job than you do if you're 35 and ready to begin a family. Same as if you're 55 or 65 and then even 75 when you maybe scale down and you want something smaller. There's a really interesting opportunity in co-living for intergenerational, so mixed generational usage in the same building. So no longer isolating students and elderly, for example, but creating a way to make this mix happen. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Co-living for elderly people is another market that is just bursting to explode. Um, elderly people are looking for a better alternative to retirement homes and often being closer to younger people, closer to city centers with more activities, more things. So this is a really interesting sector as well. And 
And uh, one more question. Uh, as we know now, the point of time when we... Uh, no. Uh, as we know, uh, for now time, the quantity of time which we spend online mm -hmm. is rising mm -hmm. every day. But in the same time, the feeling of loneliness mm. for people, especially for single people, is also rising. So, uh, if we speak about happiness, uh, do uh, people try to find happy place for them? I mean, uh, in Korean, in uh, this uh, community. Do they try to solve the problem of loneliness by this way? I think that co-living is rising out of a need to combat loneliness in an area of or in an era of digital solitude we might say we feel more connected than ever we have our friends on whatsapp on facebook part the, by the phone we can be connected at any moment to anyone yet we feel lonelier than ever yet we feel isolated and less less part of something larger i think that human happiness is dependent on feeling part of something larger, being a part of a larger project than just solitary individuality. Um, and as our society is evolving to more of a consumerist, individualist culture, I think we're finding that we're less happy than, than ever. Um, and different solutions are presenting themselves. Different design is reacting, right? We're, we're looking for design and for architecture to help us overcome these challenges. Uh, and that's what we do, that's what we're really interested in and I think co-living is, if it's done well, because there's a lot of co- I think um, co-living risks being something similar to greenwashing, where everything is organic, everything is healthy, everything is bio. Um, I think co-living risks the same thing, that developers who just want to put more people in a smaller space put the label co-living on everything to make it seem young and trendy and cool. So. It's definitely, it, 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 it's not really co-living though, right? Co-living, there needs to be an aspect of community. Um, there needs to be an aspect of community, there needs to be an aspect of sharing and being part of something larger for it to be something that's societally really interesting. Um, it also so happens that financially it will be really interesting also. Um, but this is, I think, one of the pitfalls that we're looking, that we're looking ahead to. And well. co-living and co-working also about collaboration. How do you understand it? Because, uh, in my opinion, uh, basic, uh, for basic uh, point for collaboration is uh, ideas, mm -hmm. any ideas, and uh, energy. So, what is your vision about collaboration? Um, I think creating occasions for ideas to be spread between people, um, intentionally or unintentionally, is what we look at in a space when we're looking for collaboration. Um, how is the space designed so that people aren't quarantined into a small bubble but are actually creating opportunities for them to collaborate when wanted but also having enough diversity of space where you can be solitary and get very steady work done if needed. Um, but I think collaboration is what we need in order to overcome big, big, big challenges ahead of us because the type of thinking um, that's very close and very linear uh, is only getting us so far. <laughs> and the collaboration also about inspiration and what was exactly your inspiration during the process uh, of design for Station F and Flight Nights? Um, well, we take a lot of cues from Japanese design. Uh, my co-founder and our lead architect is half Japanese, half French. We're quite an international team, huh? He's half Japanese, half French, I'm half American, half British. Another team, member of our team is British, another one is half Russian, half Ukrainian. Uh, another one is American, so we have a lot of different opinions and different views and we're having sort of a global view of, of culture. We're having sort of a global view of culture, but we took a lot of ideas from Japanese design, which are really masters of compact design, of versatile design. Um, for flatmates, for example, um, we designed furniture that was easily modular, uh, that w furniture that w was based around a sofa, a modular sofa, based around six parts that could be pulled together or pulled apart for all different types of usages of the space. Uh, and we took I ideas of Japanese use of space, uh, three in particular, uh, wa, ba, and ma, because in Occident, we have typically just one word to describe space, whereas in Japan and in other oriental cultures we have many. Um, space is not just empty or full in Japan. Space is more the social intention of what's going to happen inside. 
So we took these three terms, wa, ba, and ma. Wa essentially means harmony, harmony within yourself in relationship to other people. Ba means space, but more in the term of the space where something is going to happen. And ma is much more interesting um, of, the, of the two, but also very difficult to translate uh, because it means basically a void, the gap, the empty space between this something. this is the most interesting. <laughs> this one's the most difficult to translate, but the yes. most interesting. You can think of ma as um, the white space in a book between two lines. You can't yeah. read what's there unless you have blank space. Same with two notes in a piece of music. You need a bit of space and a bit of blank in order to put in perspective what's really there. We uh, should speak about it in informal atmosphere, I think. <laughs> oh, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's not for video, but <laughs> oh. in general. Okay, yes. I went too far into that one. <laughs> yes. Okay. So No worries, I kind of like... <laughs> I can do it a little bit more concise also. No, no, I, I mean, uh, it's very interesting topic for conversation about yeah. Mark because it's very uh, deep mm. meaning and different to translate, but uh, how to say, to feel and to understand in more global scale, mm. it's uh, really necessary. Yeah. Just a very interesting discussion for a couple of hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, principles. And what was exactly inspiration for your team? I don't know, maybe some persons, uh, some uh, places, uh, maybe you did meditation or how you got the ideas about the space? Uh, not only from rational meaning, from logic, uh, way, from statistic, but some energy, hmm. some inspiration inside. I feel like this would be a good question Many for Alto. <laughs> <laughs> I think this would be a good question for Alto, for the designer. Yeah. Probably better than me. Okay. Yeah, because he's uh, he's really the the brain behind it, behind okay. the design side of it. So probably a good question for him. Do you have feedback from Xavier? who is a developer for these uh, projects. Uh, does he like it? Uh, how, many, how much uh, investments he put in uh, this project? And uh, what is his vision uh, about the uh, future? Will, will he organize maybe something, maybe some new ideas? What is the feedback when the project already opened the door? Well, I know that I, I can't speak for Xavier now because I don't know exactly his perspective, but I know that the project is considered extremely successful in France and that he's very happy with the way that Flatmates has turned out. They're also planning a Station F in the south of France, mm -hmm. so opening up another space like this wow. in the south of France um, in the coming years. They're also opening a hotel uh, in the coming two to three years here with a Japanese architect called Kigo Kuma. Um, it's going to be a luxury hotel that's in the same property, so just down the street from here. There's a lot of development plans for the area. Um, a lot of development plans for the area. I know Station F was an investment of around 200 million. Mm -hmm. um, 200. A lot. Not bad. <laughs> uh, it's for Station F or also plus flight mates? For Station F plus flight mates. Okay, 